Welcome to Soul Food, a ministry of Calvary Chapel, Princeton, West Virginia. I'm letting all my signal. There's nothing wrong. <laughs> We're good? Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I think I was having a stroke or something. We live in a world that has gone nuts. I told you last week that if God isn't on the throne of our hearts, we will find something else to put there. And once that happens, there is no degree in which a person can sink and sometimes it is so bizarre, it's difficult to believe. Have you ever heard of transableism? Transableism refers to the thinking that you're born with body parts that you don't feel belong to you, and so you must rid yourself of these parts in order to live authentically. In Canada, a man studied how he could amputate his arm without bleeding to death, because he always felt that his arm wasn't really part of his body. So... He cut off his healthy arm because it wasn't part of who he perceived himself to be. As reported in a National Post article, he told the body modification website ModBlog, quote, My goal was to get the job done with no hope of reconstruction or reattachment, and I wanted some method I could actually bring myself to do. I'm not making this up. There are people who want to be made deaf or blind because these body parts, they think, don't represent who they really are. They, too, want to voluntarily disable themselves in order to be authentic. This condition, known as body integrity identity disorder, is a rare condition in which there is a mismatch between the mental body image and that of the physical body. And now there are even those who claim to be trans-age, such as the documented case of a 52-year-old man who now identifies as a six-year-old girl. Paul Waltz, who now refers to, to himself as Stephanie, says, I can't deny that I was married. I can't deny that I have children. But I've moved forward now that I've gone back to being a child. So he left his wife and children in order to live authentically as a six-year-old girl. He continues, While I have a mommy and daddy who are totally comfortable with me being a little girl, and their children and grandchildren are totally supportive of me. My question to you parents is, should we be okay with letting him play in kindergarten with his peers? After all, should we not applaud him for wanting to live in accordance with who he really is? Bizarre? <laughs> well, of course it's crazy. But we live in a culture where reason and common sense no longer carry any weight. And absurdity is no longer an argument against anything. Our society tells us we should applaud people for having the courage to become their true selves. Let me ask it this way. Does a man who has a healthy arm surgically removed because he doesn't feel it's a rightful part of his body, does he have a body problem or a mind problem? When a 52-year-old man identifies as a six-year-old girl, does he have a body problem or a mind problem? Just so, when someone argues they are transgender and are therefore contemplating irreversible gender reassignment surgery, they do not have a body problem, they have a mind problem. It goes without saying they also have a spiritual problem. My friends, this is the world that we live in. And that is the reason the Lord has left us down here in the words of Philippians 2.15 to shine as lights in a crooked and perverted generation. Verse 18, please. Just as you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they themselves also may be sanctified in truth. 
We learned last week that God's desire for us would be that we would be sanctified or set apart from this world that we live in. Now, of course, the challenge is the world will do everything it can to tempt us to jettison out our holiness to live for this world. The experts tell us today that everyone is for sale. Wave big money before them and they will throw off their integrity if only the price is right. That is why we are admonished in Proverbs, buy truth and do not sell it, but instead buy wisdom, instruction, and understanding. Have to wonder, are any of us for sale this morning? There is a story about a man who said to a woman, would you sleep with me for $50,000? She thought for a minute and said, well, for $50,000, yes, I think I would. He then said, would you do it for $5? To which she indignantly replied, what kind of girl do you think I am? He answered, we've already established what you are. We're only now haggling over the price. The question each one of us must answer in the quietness of our hearts, is there anyone or anything who, like Judas Iscariot, we would sell out Christ for? I readily admit before you this morning that I am far from where I want to be in the Lord today. But I know that I'm not what I used to be. I know God has transformed me from that old life I once, to use my late father's term, like a pig wallered in. That's what sanctification is. It is God doing a sovereign work in us by setting us apart from the sin that we want so loved. The mission of Christ forms the pattern for the mission of his apostles here. Earlier we read that he sanct the Father sanctified Jesus and sent him into the world. He has just prayed now that the Father would sanctify the apostles, and now he sends them into the world. The parallel is impressive. Their lives are not to be aimless. They are given a definite commission by the Lord, and it is their task to discharge it in the same way that he discharged his. So to us, every believer in here, has a call on their life in the sense of what God wants to do in and through them. In the late 19th century, William Carey felt a call to travel to India to bring the gospel to them. But believe it or not, the pastors around him scoffed at the idea by saying, young man, if God wanted to save the heathen in India, he certainly could do it without the likes of you or us. They missed the point of partnership, didn't they? God does very little on earth today without the likes of you and us. Why? He certainly could do it without us, but it is his desire to do it with us. And so Jesus says, I will not deal with you except to make you holy. And I have completely set myself apart to make you holy. You cannot come to me unless you realize it's my job, it's my mission to make you holy. Well, what is it to be holy? I propose to you that the text tells us that holiness is at least three things. It is to be wholly committed to God, to be wholly focused on God, and to be wholly renovated by God. It means to be separate it's very clear that when Jesus says, I sanctified myself, it doesn't mean that Jesus is becoming a better person. He can't mean I'm becoming a more pure person because the Bible says everywhere that he was already completely perfect. There's another place in the Bible that talks about this. It's the very same thing mentioned here in verse 19. In verse 19, Jesus says, I sanctify myself for their sakes. I set myself apart for this particular work. Now, in Luke 9, 51, Jesus says that he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem and to die. Do you hear that? He set his face like a flint. He looked at something. He would not take his eyes off of it. And he would look at nothing else. 
That's the same thing it's saying here in Luke 9, 51 as it's saying in John 17. It's another way of putting it, and it's another way of helping us understand what holiness truly is. He looks at just one thing. We call that being focused today. If you have musical aptitude, you may give yourself to practice an instrument for many years. And when you do that, there's a restriction, a limit that you place upon your own freedom. There are many thing, other things you won't be able to do with the time that you are investing in practicing. If you do do that, however, the discipline and limitation will unleash your ability that would have otherwise gone untapped. So what have you done in that case? You've deliberately lost your freedom to engage in some things in order to release yourself to a richer kind of freedom to accomplish other things. Think of it this way. A fish, because it absorbs oxygen from water rather than air, is only free when it's restricted and limited to that water. If we put it out on the grass, its freedom to move and even live is not enhanced, but rather destroyed. The fish dies if we do not honor the reality of his nature. In many areas of our life, Freedom is not so much the absence of restrictions as finding what the right restrictions are, what we could call the liberating restrictions. Those that fit with the reality of our nature and that would produce greater power and scope for our abilities and a deeper joy and fulfillment. Not doing this is the reason why many Christians live miserable and unproductive lives. Someone once said to Hannah Smith, the author of The Christian Secret of a Happy Life, he said, you Christians seem to have a religion that makes you miserable. You're like a man with a headache. He doesn't want to get rid of his head, but it hurts him to keep it. You cannot expect outsiders to seek very earnestly for anything that uncomfortable. That's fair. That's true. So rather than being miserable all the time, we ought to find ourselves increasingly becoming like Jesus, who I am convinced was the very best of company and an absolute joy to be around. The description of the early church in Jerusalem recorded in Acts 2 gives us another indication of this. Having told us that these early believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that is truth, and to the fellowship, that is unity, and to the breaking of bread and prayer, which suggests true worship leading to sanctification or holiness. It then says they also gave to anyone as they had need as an evidence of their deep and unique love. And then it says, and every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. It adds as a result, the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Who wouldn't want to go to a church like that? That is my heartfelt desire for Calvary Chapel. The Lord did it then, and he will do it for us as we accept the task for which we have been sent into the world and live like him. Now what God is saying here is pretty amazing. If you come to me, if you're wholly committed to me and you're wholly focused on me, it will change every area of your life. Every area. You may say, what does it mean to really be committed to you in the area of my work, in my child rearing, in my attitude towards entertainment, in my attitude towards other people, toward other races or my business practices? It means every area will be changed. Every single one. Now maybe not instantaneously, but bit by bit by bit, we will find we are so changed in every area of our lives that as we say around here, you're a Christian first and an American second. You're a Christian first and black or white second. Our Christianity must supersede everything in our life. Verse 20, please. I'm not asking on behalf of these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, which they, that they may be one. 
Just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I also have given to them, so that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and you love them, just as you loved me. Jesus looked ahead through the centuries and prayed for all believers who would come in the future. Although the vast majority of them has not even been born yet, they nevertheless were and have been on eternity, from since eternity, on the heart of the Savior. He knew them all, since their names were written from the foundation of the world in the book of life. Christ's intercession for us, which began with this prayer 2,000 years ago, is still going on this morning, since he always lives to make intercession for us, as Hebrews 7.25 says. Epimar has this great quote. He says, As the weight of the jewel breastplate lay heavy on the heart of the high priest of old, so does it press down on him. Verse 22 says, Jesus gave the glory to his disciples. I had to read that twice. He gave glory to those guys, to men who would deny him and abandon him. Yes. And that same glory has been given to you for whom he justified, the Bible says. He also glorified past tense. Listen carefully, saint. The Father looks at you and says, you're not only elected and predestined, called and justified, but in my sight, you're already glorified. I'm so glad the Father doesn't see me in my frailty and my flesh, my carnality and my stupidity. I am so thankful he sees me glorified in his Son. The fact that we are united with Christ and through him with God Almighty is one of the great doctrines of all of Scripture. These are the kind of beliefs the people have devoted their lives to studying. Beliefs that they have argued about and rejoiced in and sacrificed over and even died for. Things like, I believe in God, the creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. The danger is sometimes we can rattle off words like that without even asking ourselves if we really believe that truth. Many years ago, a church had just switched to having its liturgies printed by a computer. A woman named Edna had passed away, and they were trying to save some time by having the computer print the name, or the name in the order of the service that they had used for a previous funeral of a woman named Mary. They simply instructed the computer to change each instance of Mary to Edna. It worked fine until they find themselves reciting the Apostles' Creed, that they believe in Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Edna. You often have to wonder if some people even noticed it. Here, once again, Jesus prays that we will all be one in the same way, it says, that he and the Father are one. So we see that unity is something Jesus desires, but tragically, people have misapplied and abused this very truth. In our obsessively tolerant age, the opposite extreme poses a far more spiritual threat to true spiritual unity. In the name of love, many work hard to achieve a superficial, false, sinful unity that is broad enough to even embrace false Christians, even if they deny the central truths of the Christian faith. D.A. Carson notes that unity for which Christ prayed is not achieved by hunting enthusiastically for the lowest common theological denominator. And perhaps no portion of scripture has been used as often and as effectively to discourage any judging of doctrine or religious teachers than the prayer right here offered in John 17. Since he's praying for unity, some people have understood his words to mean that unity must supersede truth. They have argued since doctrine divides, which is what it's supposed to do, by the way, it should be minimized for the greater good of reaching our world. 
Friends, this once again is the importance of studying the Bible in its context. First, we are explicitly told he is praying for unity among his true followers only. And they are described as the one to whom Christ revealed the Father, and they are the ones who have obeyed his word. Second, Jesus prayed that the unity would be a unity supported by the truth. Sanctify them by your truth, he said. Your word is truth. Here he also prays for the purity of the church. He prays that the believers would be set apart for the Father's blessing and use. He is asking that the church would be pure, separate from this world, and committed to the mission. He said, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Third, Jesus prays for the holiness of the church. I do not ask you that you keep them out of the world, but you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Once again, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The church is to be sanctified. That is, a community of believers who embrace integrity, purity, and a passionate love for God. The values of this world are to be rejected because the Bible says that the one who loves the world, that the love of the Father is not in him. But mark this well. It is the love within the church that will attract the world and the holiness within the church that will convict the world. Jesus has assured us that some will believe because of our witness, but we must make sure that our witness is not only true, but also loving. Sadly, some Christians are prosecuting attorneys and judges instead of faithful witnesses. And this only turns lost sinners away from the Savior. Ephesians 4.15 says, We are to speak the truth in love. Because love without truth is hypocrisy, while truth without love is brutality. You see, if I speak the truth without love, it's like a fire with no warmth. Who wants to be in a room on a cold night with a blaze that doesn't give you any warmth? But if I speak the love without truth, it's like a blaze without light. And who wants to be in the dark? The idea is to have both light and warmth. And so unity is based upon telling the truth in love, not always easy, but absolutely necessary. And this in turn will have the consequences that the world may believe. I've been amused by a story along these lines told by Ralph Kuyper. Kuyper had became a Christian in his senior year of high school in part through 2 Corinthians 5.17 that says if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away and the new has come. Having become a new creation, he immediately began meditating on the second half of that verse which says the old is gone because he had a problem with the person of his geometry teacher and sincerely wished that she would just die and give everyone some relief. But she didn't have the good sense to die. He says she was a witch. The kind of person to whom on Halloween you would hand a room and say, this is your night, kid, do your stuff. But at last the problem drove him to a solution because he recognized that the new creature of the verse was to be himself and not the teacher. And that the things which were to pass away were his own bad attitudes. And so recognizing he was to be like Jesus Christ, he came to the conclusion that if God could love his teacher, perhaps he could too, which he eventually learned to do. True unity also does not mean uniformity in everything. In the Trinity, there exists a perfect unity and diversity in three distinct persons, yet they are one. Suppose for a moment that we could bring in some of the great Christians of the centuries together under one roof. From the 16th century, we could bring the peerless reformer John Calvin. From the 17th century, we could get John Wesley, the great Methodist advocate of free will. From the 19th century, we could get C.A. Spurgeon and D.L. Moody. And finally, from the 20th century, we could get Billy Graham. If we gathered all those men in one room, though, we would have some trouble. 
we would be able, we would be unable to get a unanimous vote on many secondary things. But underneath it all would be a unity. And the more those men lifted up Christ and the more they focused on him, the greater their unity would be among them. There would be unity amidst a great diversity of different styles and opinions. Likewise, the closer this morning that we draw to Christ, the closer we will draw to one another. Our unity can be described sort of as an inverted cone with God at the top and believers around the base. And as we ascend the slope of that cone, drawing near to God, we automatically will draw closer to other believers. Now that last part of verse 23 should cause our collective jaws to drop in amazement. Jesus just asked the Father that he would love us the same way that he loves his only begotten Son. Now there have been attempts to avoid this meaning, no doubt, because it is that tremendous. Some have treated the sentence casually as though it were saying, you have loved them because you love me. Others see it in terms of the mystical union of believers with Christ as though we are loved as Christ only because we are actually in Christ. And those, those statements are true. But they miss the full force of the sentence because they do not take that key word in the original at full value. And that word is kathos, which means just as or to the same degree that. Thus, we are told that God loves those who are Christ to the same degree, just as, and in the same way that he loves his only begotten son. It almost sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? Actually, it's one of those things in life that are too good not to be true. And this sentiment is captured in the Lord of the Rings by one of Sam's statements, which is one of my favorites of all the books. After the ring is destroyed in Mount Doom, Sam wakes up to, from his sleep and he's alive. That He's surprised that he's alive and he, there's Gandalf. Then he says, is everything sad going to come untrue? What has happened to the world? Now that statement is quite profound because it's different than asking whether good things are going to come true. Rather, it's asking whether sad things are going to become untrue. Thus, Sam's statement, like Christian doctrine, recognized there's certainly something currently very wrong in this world. It's a place that is filled with sadness, cursed with sin, groaning, the Bible says, as it waits its redemption. And in the final consummation, those sad things will be made untrue. The curse will be rolled back. The world will be changed and we will be just like him, completely sinless and full of joy for all of eternity. Just a couple quick comments on the next verses and then we can leave here and put all this into practice. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you love me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. And I have made your name known to them and will make it known so that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. Do you as a Christian ever wonder if you're going to make it to heaven? I mean, really. Do you ever think... I know the Bible says I'm going to make it, but I'm afraid I might be just that one exception. I know for a fact this morning that if you are a Christian, you are going to heaven because of a promise, a prayer, and a price. The promise we find in John 14, 1, when Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. The prayer he prayed right here in verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am so that they may see my glory which you have given me for you love me before the foundation of the world. And finally, the price he paid in 1 Thessalonians 5, 9. For God has not destined us to wrath but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with him. As we finish today, Jesus' request in this greatest prayer ever prayed can really be summed up in about seven words. The Lord 
prayed for the believer's preservation with Holy Father, keep them in your name. Jubilation, that they may have my joy made full in themselves. Liberation, by keeping us from the evil one. Sanctification, will sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Unification, that they may all be made one. Association with the Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. And finally, glorification, that they may see my glory. There was a survey done many years ago when Americans were asked what they would most like to hear in a word. Number one was, I love you. Number two was, I forgive you. And number three was, supper's ready. But if you think about it, those three statements provide a clear summary of the gospel. We are loved by God, forgiven by God, and invited to a banquet table. Let us pray. And Father, we are so thankful this morning that you have done that work, that there is nothing we can do but exalt and glory in it. And I pray, Lord, that more than that, that we would take that out of this room to those who do not have that, and we would, we would remember what it was like living in that gross darkness, trying to find anything to fill that void. And like, like you say in your word, like broken cisterns that could hold no water. Lord, reveal uh, to us the people you would have us speak to. Open up our hearts, Lord, and give us wisdom that we may take your gospel out into this world. We ask in your name, amen.